came back for patients at the clinic at one. Yeah. So that's why we couldn't take seniority. If we have to take seniority, can we do it like in the other computer lab in the morning? What's that? If we have like things to do in the afternoon, can we take it like in the morning in the other computer? But then I have to proctor it twice, and that means I spend double the time proctoring it just when I also have things to do. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we talked about this like week one of class. So you should have plenty of time to let your work schedule know and all of that. Um, yeah, so the final exam will be the 27th, which is also my husband's birthday. Um, yeah, he's turning 50. Holy cow. All right. After Mark takes you, you should be able to see. I'll double check, but I'll make sure that the will All the Mark, all the end dates will take it off. So any questions about the final? So we can just talk about what's next. There's no like new questions over the previous stuff, is there? Only stuff from the previous one? The, the old content, the, the content will study your test. Okay, so then. The new content will obviously be your question. What's the part that you have like a Um, from memory, I want to say 70-30, but I have to look, I'm going to look to make sure not email you because that could have been from last year before I changed it. <laughs> so it might be like 80-20. I have to go look at it back in the I'll email you an email. Plus, I went through and changed the test scores on that select group of people. I don't know why. I did it during the test that didn't have their grade changed. And I only had a few people email me. And when I went back and going manually back and forth between all the tests, I found that there were two more people that whose grades were not changed, Renee and Megan. So if everyone would just make sure that your grade got changed, because there was no logic to where, what happened. Because it was the, you know, the weird thing is that it was the exact same thing on both tests, which is really strange. So I don't know, there's no logic to what happened in e-learning. Um, but I changed grades on Mark, Megan, Shivani, Michelle, Susie, and Renee to make them so that they were different from the test, the quiz score, and then the grade book. So it was, should be a larger number in the grade book. So I have no idea what that happened. All right, so we can all see. Are we ready to move on? Okay, so we've already talked about amputee management if you had me for 4720, which a bulk of people in this class did. Um, you would have seen some of this material, but we're going to go into more detail about digit amputations, obviously, in this class. But I left some material in because I wanted to make sure that I stress again some things about amputees that you should make sure you review for MBCOT, okay? So um, if you look at it, when people have an amputee, it's typically because of a trauma that occurs or because of some type of damage from disease, all right? Um, if you look at, if you look at amputees, sorry, I'm flowing through that, um, most lower extremity amputees typically come from damage from disease, right? Where, and um, less from trauma. Where in the upper quadrant, it's the reverse. Because we interact with our world with our upper extremities, we typically, um, upper extremity injuries are caused from trauma. Which, I know a lot of you, some of you went to conference, but wasn't those of you that went to the opening ceremonies to talk from the couple, with the, with the amputees and the Lord told me it was just amazing. So I don't know if that's available on AOTA website, but if it is, you guys should check it out because it was really, really a good talk. It was entertaining, it was interesting, it was everything you want, so it's really good. Um, so for NBCOT, you should know the differences between a um, you know, manual or body power prosthetic or myoelectric, right? 
right? So the Bowen Cable Control System is an example of a body-powered um, process. <coughs> and for NBCOT, you should know what movements create um, open and close of the terminal device. So make sure you study that for NBCOT. Um, and then if you're above elbow amputee, you have to have two muscle groups because you have to have one that would um, create elbow motion or lock and unlock the elbow and then one movement that would open and close the terminal device. So you should know these movements for MCOT. So that's why I put it on here. Even though we covered this already back in 4720 um, if you had me. So this just shows a picture. This is a below elbow amputee and it shows the figure eight harness system, and it makes sense if you look at the motions, we go back. So shoulder flexion and abduction, and you can set it to either open and close, open the terminal device or leave it open and to do those motions to close the terminal device. But it makes sense when you look at this because this just, that would create um, tension on the cable because it's posterior. So when you flex and abduct, that would create tension, which would open the hook. Okay? Um, and then myoelectric is not a body-powered process. It uses EMG potentials. So uh, the EMG signals a muscle to create. You, you cr um, contract a muscle, which then is picked up by the EMG that operates the terminal device. So if you have like a, a bump and elbow, is the same thing to how what would be the the shoulder motion stuff? So if you look at the above elbow, you would be <coughs> scapular oh, okay. abduction to to lock and unlock the elbow. This and this. To open and close the power device. So when you think about people with amputees, you know, think of this upper trap. It's always, you're always working up, you know, to open and close that terminal device. Question about the myoelectric, this is the picture of the myoelectric, and they'll have to find out which muscles are viable at, this, at the amputee site to be able to to use those and are strong, you know, to be able to use those to, to operate the terminal device. Um, and then this has four independent functions because you, this would be for someone who would be uh, above the elbow amputee. So you could have EMG sites to operate the elbow and the terminal device. So this is a certain brand, the Utah arm. But there's tons of information out there. The eye limb is out there. If you go on, on like touchbionics.com or .org or whatever their website is, they likely had a booth at AOTA. I didn't see them there, but did you guys see them? Touch Bionics? They have, uh, did you see them? Um, they have a uh, prosthesis for just, um, for, um, for looks, they're not functional, or they also create the island, which does the individual finger motion. We talked about that in 4720. Lots of videos out there. The Greifer, which was big, uh, came out when I first started working as an OT um, for more forceful prehension than a hook, and that's what the Greifer looks like. Remember, there's the D2 um, prehensor that um, another thing you should know would be um, like the not the pounds of force on each rubber band for the terminal hook um, when for NBCOT, but that D2 prehensor, instead of using the rubber band, they use the switch that can change the strength of the hook without donning and dropping more rubber bands for to change the strength. Remember, if you were in my class, we showed the video of picking up a water bottle versus a wine bottle. You can just click it with that D2 prehensor as opposed to putting on more rubber bands to do Okay, so this aesthetic hand is just a hand that would be for appearances.
So if there was an amputation in the hand, um, this would be developed to make it look like a normal hand. And they can do amazing things. There's Pele is a company that does this, Touch Bionics does this, and there's probably others out there that I'm just not thinking of that do um, these aesthetic hands. Uh, they must be good quality because if they don't look real, people aren't going to want to use them. Um, and they must fit secure, be comfortable to wear. And sometimes if people are Caucasian skin, you would need two sets because if you get tan in the summer, your skin's going to fit look differently and then your skin tone won't match with your prosthesis. Um, but sometimes, typically these are just aesthetic, but sometimes they can be functional. So say someone didn't have a thumb, but they, they had an aesthetic thumb um, fabricated, the thumb wouldn't move, wouldn't have sensation, but it would be opposed to a pose against. So it could stabilize things, hold things, but no sensation and no motion that is typically created. <coughs> now with the implementation of these 3D printers and all types of technology, there are, um, and even Touch Bionics is working on developing just in the hand prosthetics that are functional. Because that's the problem. If you, if you amputate your hand partially, but not enough, then you're not the right fit for a prosthesis, you know? So um, they're coming out with, so if someone in the past had their hand was present, so they had a wrist joint, but they didn't have digits, there was no prosthesis available for them. But now technology is changing, and they're coming out with prostheses that would fit over, that would provide finger motion, like, um, like the island, to create finger motion. But these are, their function is for looks and to be an opposable force to hold. No sensation, no move motion. But there's no sensation in any prosthesis, so it's going to be very difficult for, for patients to use. But you can see, here's the amputated sides, and then here's with, with the aesthetic um, prosthesis. Provides appearances, right? But also could be functional to be something to oppose against, to be able to grasp things easier, to give length to a digit function but it's not going to move and then these are just attached then to cover the seams you would wear a ring of some kind and you can do all kinds of creative things a ring at the site where the seam was did you guys at conference see some of these aesthetic hands did you see any they like to have a booth or two or three because it's a big industry So, um, so with the prosthesis fitting, uh, it's, it's, it's really challenging for patients because patients, when they have an amputee, hear about all these wonderful things that are available, but not everything is covered by your insurance. So the aesthetic prosthesis would typically be an out-of-pocket cost for patients, unless you had a, um, in Michigan, were injured in an automobile accident, or if it was a worker's compensation injury. Also, um, if I were to lose a limb, God forbid, I would be covered through my Blue Cross Blue Shield policy, which is a good policy through the university, but I would be fit, fit with a hook body powered prosthesis. My insurance would not cover a myoelectric um, device for me to use as an amputee. So all of these things are out there, but there's a select few number of people that can benefit from them because of cost. Um, so, so it's, it's really hard because when people have an amputation, it's a loss of limb, it's a loss, it's a grieving process, and then when you hear that you can't get the fancy schmancy hand that you heard about on the news, that's even more of a, a problem for people. But the earlier you fit people with the prosthesis, the more likely they will to use it because of the whole sensation factor. They have to get used to to practicing it. And even I think in 4720, I told the story about my patient that had a below elbow amputee um, 
from a, an accident, was fit, but it was 13, probably now 16 years ago, fit with a body-powered prosthesis, and then her shoulder started wearing out. So she was very um, skilled at using the hook prosthesis, and then she got the fancy eye limb through her insurance because it was auto, and they didn't have that when she um, first injured her arm. And she was fit with um, the island, and she didn't really like it. She wasn't. She would wear it sometimes, but not all the time. When she wanted to get things done quickly, she was way more skilled with the with the hook process because she had been doing it for a long time. So the quicker you get somebody in something, the more compliant um, compliant patients will be. But when you look at what we do with these patients, it's really the same thing that we do with all of our patients, right? We control edema, get the range of motion back in the remaining area. With these patients, we'll have to desensitize. I don't like the word stump, so I use the word residual limb. Um, you'll have to desensitize that, get the edema down to prepare for prosthesis, which is different with these patients. But everything else is the same, scar management, wound care, strengthening, edema management. But with strengthening, you'll want to strengthen the muscles that the patient's going to use with their prosthesis, right? And, um, and strengthen the ones that they won't after they get their prosthesis, because then those might be ignored, you know? Like my patients that, that's going to be doing flexion and abduction all day to operate their terminal device um, or scapular protraction, they might then have weak scapular retractor, retractors or have postural problems later on because they're so used to doing all of this movement, right? Um, also, sometimes our weight changes differently with the weight of the prosthesis, the weight of my arm that I no longer have, so we might have to address posture based on that as well. But things just to think about with, um, with amputees. But most things that we see in hand therapy really are digital ray amputations or digit amputations. So um, it might be a partial digit amputation, which is extremely common, um, where the amputation is distal to the MP joint, somewhere out on the finger. Um, and with these patients, you know, it's challenging because the patient wants to always save as much of their limb as they possibly can. And if you ask them at the time of the trauma, right, save as much as you can, right? But sometimes too much is saved for function. So when you look at recreating something, you have to have a good, strong foundation of bone, right? But then you have to have something to cover it. And when we look at our fingertips, we have this fatty pad on the, the ends of our digits. I haven't talked about this before, have I? It's like it's hard for me to remember because I've talked about this before and then I'm like, did I already cover this? Um, but sometimes if you have too long a bone and not as good of a fatty pad or soft tissue coverage, then when patients try to use their fingers for resistive use, they don't have enough pad and it's hypersensitive, it's painful, and it's non-functional and the patients end up leaving it out of the way and not incorporating it into function anyway or maybe have to go back and have a um, additional surgery for modification of their residual limb to decrease the bony length to get a better soft coverage over the finger. Does that make sense? Because you need uh, pads on our molar hands for function. And if you have, if the bone was length, length was preserved, but not a good enough soft tissue, you got to have good enough soft tissue. Uh, neuroma can be a complication that forms, and that's where the end of the nerve is just looking for the rest, and it creates this bulbous fo formation that can happen with amputees, and you get this very localized pinpoint tenderness and hypersensitivity, which is very challenging to get rid of. Um, typically for neuromas, the docs will actually go in and slice it off, cut the end off, and try to bury the end of that nerve somewhere so it's not going to develop all that hypersensitivity. Sometimes if you have the whole digit amputated at the MP joint area, they will go back in and also resect the full ray. So um, for example, if you have a long finger amputation at the MP and the whole finger is gone, 
When you try to hold small objects like money or pills, you now have a gap in the smack dab in the middle of your hand. So it makes it really challenging functionally to hold small objects. So what the docs will do is they'll go back in later, remove the metacarpal, align these two back together. So now you maybe only have, what well, would be this one's gone, but you'd have three digits, but they would all be in unison together so you can hold small objects in your hand without them falling out the gap. So I've had patients that have had this done, not initially, because usually at the site of trauma, you don't think about that, and you're like, no, a save is everything that you can, right? But then they go to use their hand functionally, and they realize all the implications that this gap is creating, and that they go back and they have the metacarpal excised. Okay, so um, we've talked a little bit about graphs and things in other sections like wound care and such, right? But um, when we talk about graphs, that is when you take skin from point A and cover point B. So I take skin from my hypophenar eminence and I amputated my long finger in the middle phalanx area and they take skin from here and they put it on to cover the end where the amputation occurs. A split thickness skin graft. Um, sometimes they will have to do different surgical procedures with the skin um, to, great, to create greater skin coverage, and that's called either a V or a Y advancement, where they try to get the skin to go over the whole end. Sometimes they'll do a cross finger flap. So now we're on to flaps. Have we talked about flap and graft yet? A little bit? So a flap is where you take skin over, but you keep it with it to get the blood supply to come over. Remember we talked about that? So one way is a cross finger flap. So say I amputated the end of my small finger, I could take skin from my ring finger over to my small finger to cover the end, leave it there for approximately three weeks for the blood supply and the graft to take. And then it's excised, and they take skin as a graft from somewhere else to cover where they took the skin from my lump, from my ring finger. So cross finger flap. Fener flap, where I might have my digit sewn into my fener area. Say if I had a ring finger amputation, they sew the end into my fener flap and then leave it there for three weeks, which then I'm concerned about PIP contractures, you know. And then it's released, and then you work on moving the finger. And sometimes with that skin, and even the hypophenar area, it's um, bulky enough that they don't have to take skin from somewhere else because it's it's loose there. You got like a little extra, right? So those are commonly used with digit amputations. Um, but but following amputation, we're going to try to work on wound care. We're going to protect the graft. Um, if there is one, get the edema under control, um, control the scar, and something else that we do with these patients is we might control the, how the, the tip of the finger is formed. So sometimes if I amputate it and they sew it in a straight line, I have like dog ears on the outside. So instead of my finger being round, it's like a box. So you'll do things to shape um, the ends. and then, get range of motion going, and get the tip desensitized so the patient will use it for function. These are things that I use to help scar management, but also I use a lot of these digit caps to help shape the tip to be round and to address scar. And these also help get edema out of the tip because they're really constrictive. So it's increasing the tissue pressure from the outside to really be able to control edema. Yeah. If you had a situation, like you were talking about, if there was not enough like padding at the tip, could someone wear something like that long term? They could. I've had they patients, and I might not put the whole tip on, I might cut like a little rim of it, Yeah. or use, like whenever I give these for amputations, I always have to cut some off, and I keep them for things just like that, um, and I'll take that rim and give them a whole bunch of them, like these will be pad for your fingertip if they don't want to have anything 
have the, the length reduced, absolutely. But then you lose sensation, right. so it depends on what you're doing for work. Or... And I like um, this Gel Smart by Petafix. It's like a third of the cost of the gel, the, um, the silicone gel that you get through like a Patterson Medical or a um, North Coast. It's way cheaper and I found just as good results with that. So I like using that company because it's a lot cheaper. They also make their version of these digicaps, which if you get them through Silipose, you'll pay like $50 for six, which is outrageous, where with this company, you'll pay like $13 for six. So it's really so much, uh, such a better deal. Better deal. Other things that you can do um, with, to control edema if you have a longer, or a, a more proximal um, amputation, tuba grip sleeve, and you know, tuba grip comes in different sizes um, to, based on the circumference of the, end of the part that you're on. Also, Coban. Sometimes I'll take Coban and I'll wrap it around the digit, and then I'll take one, a little piece, and I'll make an X over the top of the digit, and that can help to shape it, to get it to conform to a nice round digit tip. And this is called Coflex, which is a cheaper version of Coban, or you can get vet wrap at Tractor Supply, you know, like for even the cheaper down the line versions of it. So here's a patient, kind of hard to see because you got these fingers just reaching out at you, but this is very common. So he had an amputation of his index and long finger um, and then had a laceration to the thumb. But these are things that you would very commonly see in the hand clinic. And I don't know how well you can see it, but what do you think about the wounds? How would we dress that? How would we treat it? I think it's just more like a scab. Escar is like a thick, leathery. Yeah, it's just um, scab over the incision area. Yeah. A little maceration of the middle finger. There's a little. Yeah, and that's a good point. Like I, when people cut their long finger, I no longer call it the long finger because it's not long, right? So I change it to middle finger because you know. But it, it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell from your view. I can see it better on my computer. Yes. So would you treat that kind of like how you would treat lymphedema, and would you kind of push it proximally and work? Um, you could, but I'm not going to spend a lot of my time in the clinic doing lymphedema massage. I'm going to increase the tissue pressure from the outside, which they can wear all day. And in the clinic, I need to get those PIPs moving. Okay, kind of compression. Yeah, I need to address the wound, get the PIPs moving, and they're out the door. So like, remember, I may only have 30 minutes with that patient. If I spend 30 minutes doing lymphatic drainage, what is that? What do the fingers matter if they're stiff? You know, they've got so just if you increase the tissue pressure from the outside with Coban wrapping, because we can't use those silicone pads until the wound wound is completely healed. And you're pushing it proximally, or if you can, if you push it this way, then wouldn't that be more maceration? Yeah, there's no way to push it this way unless you have a wound where it's going to come out anyway. You want always to move the edema proximally. So when you wrap the finger, you always start distally and wrap proximally with the coban or any part because you always want to start distally and then you're pushing the fluid proximally as you wrap because there's nowhere for it to go out, right? So here's his fingers again, a little bit better picture so you can see um, his incision sites. And his sutures are still in, you can see them a little bit here, right? Because sutures are going to stay in a little bit longer in fingers and hands than in other parts of your body. Um, so he's healing, he's doing great. Um, swollen, right? We can see he's swollen because look here and look there and there, right? See the difference? So we can see that he's obviously swollen. And we have a little open area here with the suture there, so we don't know what happened, if it just opened up or or whichever. I have another question about those. But, um, so does it use 
edema or really anything to do with this have implications in the central slip? So well, the central slip, the edema would really, the, this much edema would have been bent for central slip. And his central slips are intact, otherwise these guys would be bent. Right. They'd be droopy, right? Does that often get uh, damaged with issues that are trauma? It depends on the level. Right. And this guy was really um, psychosocially adapted to his amputation. And if you look over here, he's an experienced amputee. Right? So he already lost the tip of his other thumb. And um, his wife actually made him a shirt, I don't think I have the picture, like stubbies or stump, stumpies, woodworking, whatever, you know. He would wear it to the clinic, he loved it. You know, like he was, he was very adapted. But you could have a patient with just a corner of their finger gone this much. And it's the end of life as we know it. You know, it, it can have huge variations in how people tolerate this kind of thing. Can't look at it, gonna pass out when you take the dressings off. So you have to put yourself where the patient is at that time because he was fine, you know, he was fine. He took these pictures himself and gave them to me later. I didn't ask him for the pictures. You know, he was super fine with everything. But you can see even his hands a little bit edematous there, right? Um, and I made him these uh, molds once his sutures were out and his skin was healed. And these I used to help shape the tips because when the sutures came out, and everything, he was not, he was kind of cone-headed-ish a little bit. So we did this to help round his digit tips. And his thumb is healed. You can see the little shiny scar up there at the top, but it's nice and flat. And he's doing great. So these are very common in the hand therapy world. You'll see lots of digit tip amputations if you're in a uh, level two in hand therapy. How long do you keep them on for? Those? Yeah. I only want them to wear those at night. Why is that? It's covering the joint and it can limit the range of motion. It could limit range of motion. What were you going to say? Um, menstruation. It's not breathable. Is it? It's not breathable. Yes, you have to watch about how long you're wearing it. And I think I angled this down because his scar went, this was raised down there on the one side. But I want their fingertips to experience the world, right? If I keep them huddled in a little cap all day, they're not going to decrease their hypersensitivity. I want it touching textures. I want it using it for things. And if I left those on all the time, he would get in the habit of using his ring finger to oppose his thumb for doing all kinds of functional tasks. And then that would be hard to break. So I usually only use <coughs> those um, silicone gel caps or these at nighttime, unless I have someone without good, um, like someone, was it Michelle that mentioned, <coughs> if they don't have good pad and they're a laborer, I might give them that for work. But usually only nighttime. And then I might identify like what finger it's for. You can do one, two, three, I, M, R, S, and then, um, I think I had the fingers identified in the back, and then for this one, he couldn't tell what way it went, so I put a P for palm on there. They should only fit one way, but sometimes it's harder to figure out if they go this way or this way. So mark it so they know where, where it goes. Okay, so that's a quick, and quick on um, digital amputations, which are very common and you will for sure see. And now we're going to move on to congenital deformities, which if you work in PEDS, you might see more than if you work in a hand clinic. I've seen some of these deformities in the hand clinic, but not all of them. But we're just going to go through these just so you have some exposure and know what to look for. Um, so a transverse deficiency is really just a congenital amputation. It's a congenital shortening. Um, and it's defined by the last remaining bone segment. Um, so short below the elbow is the most common of transverse deformity, but it could be in a digit, um, anywhere. Oops, how did I get there? I got 
Yeah, all the way to the biceps. Radial deficiency is another, um, and when, if you study for the CHT exam, these will all be on there, like there are questions on all the congenital deformities. But radial deficiency can be bilateral, um, sometimes because the radial deficiency, the hand will flop over to the radial side, so it will rest in a deviated position, um, and then it's classified as either a short radius or a no radius present. Um, arthrogryposis is a joint contracture present at birth, non-progressive. Um, it could be an upper extremity and lower extremity. And here is just a cute, cute little baby um, that shows this arthrogryposis. Posis. <laughs> um, uh, and I have on my notes here. 11% only in lower extremity, 4% only in upper extremity. So usually by, you know, uppers and lowers, 84% um, would be the rest. Um, and the positions would be shoulder internal rotation, wrist, um, volar and ulnar, so flexed and only deviated, um, hip flexed, abducted, externally rotated, which is maybe, I don't know if it has a contracture or not. Um, elbows extended and then pronated, and then you could have a um, the club foot would be another example. Hypoplastic thumb is just an underdeveloped thumb. This could be a part of a radial deficiency. Um, along with that, and here is a picture of a hypoplastic thumb, just underdeveloped. Syndactyly would be an abnormal interconnection between the adjacent digits. Would would be that are like webbed fingers, so these fingers are joined together. My daughter has a friend with all kinds of congenital hand deformities, and I really just want to check them out, but I don't want to, you know. Um, and she's had some of her syndactylies corrected and some not. But, um, yes. Does this occur in the toes, too? It can occur in the toes. Yeah. So usually then this would just be released, you know, so you'd have independent use of the fingers. And then I was just quizzed by a doctor about a year ago. If it starts to scar back or grow back, it's called creep. I didn't know the answer to that when he asked me. So creep is what would occur if the syndactyly starts to crawl or um, grow into the web again after surgical release. Camptodactyly, I've also seen, which is a painless flexion contracture of the PIP joint, which is progressive. And here's an example. The person that I've seen in the, in the clinic, or actually two people, also were um, small fingers. Flexion contracture. Clinodactyly is a curvature of the small finger, and that's from this extra delta bone that occurs at the PIP joint a DIP joint, and this can progress and worsen, um, and usually not surgical, surgical intervention unless there's big time functional implications and that would be frequently bilateral. But I've seen people for this too, I've used the little <coughs> silicone the sleeves and cut the little, a little ring of it to put it around this area at the DIP because if it's their dominant hand and they're writing or doing a lot of, you know, art or other things, that pressure with that additional bony formation can become really painful. Mm -hmm. So I'll just try to pad it with something first before they head to surgery, but that's clinodactyly. So that's just a quick and dirty overview of some of the congenital deformities that you would see in the upper extremity. And you may not see them in the hand clinic, you might see them in with peds if you worked in a pediatric clinic. Did you guys see any, any at the Calvin Peds mm -hmm. clinic, any hand deformities? No? Okay, so we talked about this in neuro. Um, we talked, we've alluded to this in other talks this semester. But complex regional pain syndrome is another topic in this talk, and the old name is RSD, 
And someone just said to me the other a few weeks ago, RSD, you know, they used to call it complex regional pain syndrome, but the old name is RSD. The new name is complex regional pain syndrome. So this is a post-traumatic, which means something typically happened that initiated the onset of these sympathetic symptoms. And you get this neuropathic pain, pain that would not be ordinary, out of the ordinary, or not be ordinary with those different stimulations, right? So symptoms that you would have would be pain, and then these vasomotor or pseudomotor um, symptoms, which we're going to listen to another slide, and then there's different types. But here's a picture of it, and if you've seen it before, you'll never forget it. You can see the shiny, you can see edema, you can see changes in hair growth, right? Here's another picture. Um, this reminds me actually of a, like a patient following stroke that would develop complex regional pain syndrome or shoulder hand syndrome. Um, but this color changes, shiny, edema, those types of things. So you can have changes in hair growth, you can have changes in hydration, so some people have hyper um, sweaty, or hyperhydrated, or hypo, which would be <coughs> increased dryness. So if you look at, you know, remember you're back in neuro when you learned about the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system, right? And they do opposite to regulate our bodies. And when people develop complex regional pain syndrome, this is out of whack. Right? So some people present as more of a dilator, where they'll be red, purpley, um, edematous, hyperhidrosis, or the hyper sweating, warm to touch, where some people might present as more constricted, where they would be white or blue in color, they would be cold to touch, they would be dry. So they can present. I would say from my experience, more people present, from my experience, dilated than, con than constricted. But you, would, you could see either. So ways that it's tested is, um, one thing is you could, if someone has had it for long standing, they're not using their hand for function, on x-ray, they'll look like they have um, osteoporosis. They'll have less bone formation because they're not weight bearing in their hand. They're not using it for functional tasks. So long term or long presentation of this, they'll actually be changed on X-ray. Um, sometimes doctors will do other tests just to rule out what else it could possibly be because they're not sure. One way to look at it is if there's a difference in temperature from one hand to the other, um, sweat. And then another way to diagnose, is, to diagnose it is by putting a block in the cervical region to see if that reduces the pain. And that would be positive if, so, if it does. So now when you get patients, I've gotten patients before that had a diagnosis of CRPS and I wasn't really sure that they actually had full-blown CRPS. I've had patients that get referred that have CRPS and they're not diagnosed or that maybe are on the verge of CRPS but, um, but, but not diagnosed. But, so you'll see all of these things though. These are the things that you'll see. The pain will be out of the ordinary at what you typically see with that diagnosis. And there'll be other red flags. <clears throat> like for example, I had a patient one time, came in, distal radius fracture, okay? Treated by a general orthopedic. She comes in, and I usually use a hand wedge for people to rest their arms so I can see things easily when I'm evaluating them. And I had a terry cloth towel on the hand wedge. And I always have tissues in the clinic because a lot of my patients end up crying, right? But I just take, she took the tissues and she laid it over top of the terry cloth and then put her hand down. That's a big red flag. She does not want, she's hypersensitive. She doesn't want to touch that terry cloth, right? 
she had CRPS, which was undiagnosed. Um, the lady that Dave and Andrew had in the clinic with the LRTI, do you remember her? I do. <laughs> Oh yeah, you saw her a lot because that was like the last week, and then you were with Tim. Yeah. Okay, so he evaluated her, but I was on my work with her. Okay, so she came post LRTI, but she had a lot of these symptoms, and she said to me, "Well, at least I don't." I said, and I presented it as, "Oh, you're having some sympathetic changes, right?" I don't use the CRPS because I don't diagnose things first of all, right? Um, and she said to me, oh, at least I don't have RSD. My niece had that, and that was terrible. Right? And I'm going along with that. Because if I tell her that she has, I think she's on the verge of getting it too, how will, she, how will that do for her? Will that increase her stress level, yes. which will impact her CRPS? Right? And then you guys don't know this because you didn't get to follow through with seeing her, that then she had to go... She, she still wasn't through the woods yet with her CRPS. She had to stop therapy because her husband was diagnosed with terminal cancer. Mm -hmm. And so what kind of impact do you think that would have on her CRPS? Because there's certainly a psychosocial impact on all the people that I've seen that have developed CRPS. So you just have to be very careful. Don't say, oh, I think you have complex regional pain syndrome, right? You have, a, you have some sympathetic changes. That's why you're having this extra hair growth, or that's why you're so red, or, and explain it like that. And then I'm for sure gonna call the doctor's office and let the doctor know what I'm seeing, because the earlier that you start treatment with blocks and such, the better outcomes the patients will have. Um, so all those things I talked about, temperature, edema hair growth, Dryness, dryness or excessive sweat, sweating. And I've had people sweat so much they drip. Sweating. Changes in nail growth. Pain out of the ordinary. Not, it shouldn't be that painful. Edema. Um, problems with range of motion. And some kind of color changes. The red, the blue, the purple, the white. So this just makes me think of George from the pain or from the hand clinic. Yeah. But how for his, because he didn't have a specific spot it would present. Right, but when he started, like you saw him the second semester, semester after yeah. I had been seeing him for a while. Right. Did you see him before the amputation or after? After. After. Mm -hmm. So when he first came in, he okay. presented like Yeah, because I was like, how would you know that his was that or something Yeah, his else? seemingly yes. was completely resolved, but he certainly had psychosocial issues going on. So right. this person, which is kind of a segue into our next topic, biceps ruptures, was treated for a biceps rupture, ended up um, being diagnosed with complex regional pain syndrome, came in, wasn't using his arm for anything, even though he was allowed to, um, guarded, color changes, pain out of the ordinary, um, edema, all of these um, and warm to touch. Absolutely different, just not a temperature gauge, but my own hands touching right to left. And then he was doing really well following his complex regional pain syndrome, and I was trying to discharge him because he was, he was developed full range of motion, was doing great, and then he calls me, wants me to come in during Christmas break, and I come out, and he had accidentally amputated his other hand long finger? I think it was finger? his index and long finger. And I think just one finger. Or, index okay, just his finger. Index, yeah. When he was cleaning a gun, or trying to fix a gun that wasn't working right, and it shot his other finger off. So he had complex regional pain syndrome, biceps rupture, then digital amputation at the MP joint. But he didn't really need a ray resection. I mean, he could have if this had been, it was the index, because he had kind of an enlarged metacarpal head that was impacting function a little bit. But certainly a psychosocial. He had issues with his marriage, issues with his kids, issues with his mother, no issues with us, but um, everybody else issues. But 
So I don't, we don't diagnose, but if I see these symptoms, I treat it and address it right away and get the doctor on board and get them going, and the doctor will take it from there. Are the psychosocial issues because of this, or did he have that before? Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Yeah. I don't know the patient until they already have it or they already have their trauma. And also, uh, with CRPS, do they often get the block as opposed to treatment? Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. There's not a lot out there treatment-wise, um, but for treatment, getting them referred early, <coughs> and they need a multidisciplinary approach where they have the blocks and they have some type of counseling support um, to help them. And then usually they'll come right from the blocks to hand therapy because that's when they want to have the most success of trying to get them to be able to do more in the clinic when they're when they're when they have the block the most recently. So a lot of times you have to coordinate the therapy appointments with wherever they're going at the pain clinic um, to address that. And you know, it was interesting at the conference, I went to a talk that was called Give the, Give the Brain a Hand. And they talked just a little bit about complex regional pain syndrome. But when, when George went to the pain clinic, he also had counseling and they tried some um, some new approaches where they try to stimulate the brain with, um, with using uh, sequences of visual presentation and auditory. So it might be something auditory that you hear and then in visual with like images of color or, did, did George talk to you guys about that? Not really. I don't remember him telling So he really felt that that was something that was helpful for him and his counselor presented that to him as another something that would help distract or relieve his I know pain. he did something with music too. Yeah, there was music, Yeah, there was auditory and visual yeah, stimulation. Yeah, like he would have to sit and put in a CD or something. And right. I think just, I don't remember what he had to look at though. Yeah, there was both combined. Um, but, yeah. Can you say more about the belly block? Yeah, so they'll block the nerve bundle from going to that side. Is that a, so that's a surgery thing then? Nope, it's an injection okay. that they do. They'll block the side. Oh, okay, it's a nerve, okay. it's a nerve block. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So these are things that we do in therapy. So when you think CRPS, the first thing that should pop in your head with patients and for the NBCOT, right, would be a stress loading program. Okay? So with the stress loading program, it's a combination of joint compression and joint distraction, which could be done through, through uh, rote exercise or through functional activities, right? So if I wanted them to get joint compression, I might have them do scrubbing exercises. Right? Because as I wait there, I'm getting joint compression. Right? Carrying, carrying items creates joint distraction. So it's also called a scrub and carry program. But it's referred to as stress loading. What you want to do is systematically desensitize the extremity to the world, to getting pressure, to um, different textures, um, those types of things, but also incorporate this joint compression and joint distraction as part of the stress loading. A distrophile is a device, because the rehab world has to make something to sell, right? So it's a device that, it's like a handheld, looks like a, a box, um, and it has a gauge and it won't gauge a, a wrap unless you press it down far enough. So you have to weight bear into it and then it measures a stroke. So you put it on a pad and it's just a way, you can do the same thing through scrubbing with a towel, but this measures if they're getting enough weight to, for it to count. So I can measure that. Mirror therapy um, has also been used uh, with success in the literature with complex regional pain syndrome. Um, thermal modalities, I try to do the opposite of how they present, but I also do what they 
like. If they don't like it, I don't do it. So if they present as really dilated, I might want to use ice in preparatory. If they pre present as constricted, I might want to use moist heat to try to counteract what's happening or their presentation. Um, TENS is listed as an option. I haven't had success really with that, um, but it is out there as another opportunity. Um, edema management, you know, a lot of times just strict elevation, you need to increase the compression, um, the tissue pressure uh, to get the edema under control. And then getting their overall body circulation, um, controlling their diet, whether in caffeine and alcohol, um, that kind of thing for Combs Regional Fever Syndrome. So now I get to tell you a case study, and that might be, might be all that we have time for today. Um, and then we'll cover just bicep structures next time. So, you know, I've been working as a clinician for a long time, and it's such a rewarding job because they're, I already told you about this story about the one patient I never helped. Yes. Did I tell you already about it? So you don't need to hear it. Okay. And I have pictures. Did I show you guys pictures of him? I maybe talked about him in neuro. So usually every patient that I treat has a positive, some, maybe not, a, you know, full back to normal, but a positive outcome, right? That's what we go into this for is to give patients, to work with patients to help them gain improvement. So um, there was this patient that I saw, and he um, injured his hand when he had a slip and fall on the ice. So you know how when you open your car door in the winter and you go to step out of your car and then you don't realize there's an ice patch below you because there could be snow on top of it, and you, you know, fall. And he fell partially in the car, out of the car, but he had a hyperextension injury with his hand. And he came to see me. And the doctor that referred him was brand new to town, so I didn't have an established relationship with him. So you know me, a little bit negative Nellie, unless you earn someone's trust, you may question whether they did something right. So my first inkling was, oh, this doctor missed something because there's something definitely wrong with this patient's hand. Because he was so incredibly swollen. Um, so I think I saw him initially, he had orders for range of motion, home program, and a, make a resting hand splint. So the doctor wanted him to rest. So I made him a resting hand splint day one, started giving him active range of motion exercises, and he just was not progressing. I had called the physician a couple of times, talking to him about the case, just asking for guidance, because I didn't feel like he was moving in the right direction. He actually, in that time, also went to U of M to see a specialist that deals with complex regional pain syndrome. He also had that diagnosis when he came to me. Um, his diagnosis was like hand sprain with complex regional pain syndrome. He went to a specialist at U of M who again did all kinds of tests with him and the verdict was the same, complex regional pain syndrome. So I worked with him, the doctor and I had several conversations and he was very easy to talk to. He's like, maybe I should have done a fasciotomy to release the pressure from the edema and we're just both talking about this case like what the heck like I was even starting to question whether he was like a Munchausen's where he was purposely doing something that would contradict his improvement um, he had a psychosocial presentation and that he was recently discharged from the military and um, he also somewhat had which I didn't learn about till later into this, that he was having some marital problems. Um, so psychosocial presentation, tried everything. I tried lymphedema techniques, doing the full bandaging to try to impact the edema. Didn't work. His motion kept getting worse. His edema kept getting worse. His skin integrity kept getting worse. And to the point where I didn't, there was nothing else that I had not tried and nothing that, that I did was working. And I got to the point where I was just like, I feel like I'm wasting your money, your time, your insurance company's money. And he had, because he was partially in the car, his auto covered it because he was falling out of his car. So insurance wasn't a limitation, but he wasn't making progress. He was going the opposite direction. And so I ended up discharging him for therapy just because nothing that I was doing was working. And I couldn't justify myself to keep seeing him. And I would see him at um, 
And the doctor wanted him to stop wearing the splint, and he would not. It was like, it was falling apart. He had duct tape all over it because he wanted to keep wearing it because he wanted protection and to keep it isolated. He also had two little boys that would 